My name is Simon Marciniak. Um, I'm, um, um, I work as a lawyer um, in a central London law firm. I, I live in North East London um, and I've been a Muslim for approximately just over five years now. I first heard about Ashura um, through, well, the friend who introduced me to Islam in the first place. Um, it's somebody I used to work with. Um, and, and when he was introducing me to to the principles of Islam, he, he also mentioned as a um, as a separate subject the, the, the story of Imam Hussein, the, the story of Ashura. Um, it wasn't really the reason. What, it wasn't really. I, I would say it wasn't really a factor behind my conversion. It, it wasn't at, at the forefront of my thinking. Um, but it um, it's something. It's, it's a sort of a, a feeling I think that developed over time. Um, I suppose my first real contact with the with, with the um, uh, with the story was when I uh, went to Lebanon in 2010, which was shortly before I converted. Um, we, I went with my friend to the Bekaa Valley to Baalbek. It was actually to see the Roman ruins there, but we stumbled upon the shrine of um, the daughter of Imam Hussein, who uh, Khawla alayhi salam. Obviously, it's it's it's, it's quite a uh, an unreal event in many ways because it's hard to understand how so soon after the Prophet came with the message of Islam how there could have been this huge split between on the one hand the um, the uh, this group of, who claimed to be Muslims who claimed to be upholding them in the, the um, Islamic faith and on the on the other hand the family of the, the Prophet who are proclaiming something completely different and to have this confrontation in the way seemed a bit unreal to me and, a, and a, uh, I can't I'd, something you, you can't really quite grasp when you hear it for the first time. I went to uh, Kerbala at the end of 2012 um, with, with a group. Um, I, d um, I didn't do the whole walk um, on that occasion um, and in fact, I fell ill. I fell quite ill with gastroenteritis um, when I was in Najaf. So I couldn't really. So I stayed with a, a family friend for the week while the rest of the group travelled to um, um, travelled to Kerbala either by foot or by coach. Um, and I thought I was never going to make it because I was stuck in Najaf. The roads were closed off, and um, there was no obvious way of me getting there because um, um, I was still recovering from illness at that time. I still really wanted to go and, and, f and complete the journey. Um, but um, through, a, through a friend of a friend of a friend we managed to find this person who was travelling who worked for the government who could take me in a car through the various checkpoints. Um, I got to a check, one checkpoint, was dropped off there and then waited for a, an ambulance to be sent from the Haram, the Haramain, to collect me and to bring me into the centre of Kerbala through this throng of people. And uh, if, you, if you know Albain at that time, it's just completely manic, wall-to-wall -wall people. So any sort of, there's no normal transport into the centre of Kerbala. And it had to be an ambulance <laughs> from the Haramain that took me in. So it was, uh, and then when, uh, when we were approaching the Haramain, the, um, we had to take a detour because there was a, um, a pickpocket who'd stolen a wallet. So there was a big clamour and, and the ambulance shot off after this pickpocket and eventually caught up with him in the his field and surrounded him. And I, and I was there in the back of this ambulance in the middle of this commotion. Um, eventually, I made it to the hotel and into Kerbala, but it was a, a quite an a amazing experience. I never thought it would have unfolded in that way. Um, but eventually, I rode in Kerbala, and, and it, it, it was a very sort of a whirlwind of emotions, really, from from feeling ill, for having this experience of traveling there. It was it was quite unsettling in many ways. Um, um, and Alba in itself was a very intense experience. Um, it, it is a bit like Hajj in, in terms of the numbers of people. There's even more so there. It's sort of um, uh, um, wall-to-wall people, um, uh, th crowds everywhere, and and it is. And, and then going into the into the shrine itself is an extremely intense experience. One you don't forget the chanting, the the repetitions of. of noise and generally the clamour and euphoria, that's how I describe it, it's, it's the euphoria of the occasion which really strikes you during Arbaeen. 
Um, probably not the best thing for me in my in my state. I think I would, if I was going for the first time, I would have gone during a more quiet period where I could reflect on my own, which you can do on Hajj. You know, there are times on Hajj when you can reflect quietly to yourself. Um, but um, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting experience, and one I'll never forget. I think listening to this the the, the, the stories is it, it's important. I think to have the reminders of what the people achieved. Um, um, over the course of these ten days, from Muslim Ibn Akil, from um, Abbas, through Khur, through Imam Hussein himself, all these people have different aspects to the story, which bring home. It, it sort of it, it invokes a lot of humility, I'd say. It, it makes you feel very um, grounded to to listen again repeatedly to these stories and remember why they why, why they behaved in the way they did. I think there are probably two people I'd say I drew particular inspiration from for different reasons. Um, Khord is one of them, because you think of the way that, why that happened, this person who was on the brink of going to hell, according to the accounts, who then suddenly f turns um, on, on the day of Ashura. Um, and and, and, and that, that, the, that's a particular striking personality for me because it shows that um, particularly coming from a non-Muslim background you look at the people around you and you know that it just reminds you to give the benefit of the doubt all the time to the nth degree not to be judgmental about people not to condemn people even people who are against you who are attacking your faith it just reminds you um, that that um, you know there's a spark even in the most well, from your point of view, corrupt person that could just turn them and in, into something much better. Um, that's one one person I particular. That's one well person I particularly admire. But an event which is very striking about the about, about Ashura. The the other um, personage is Zainab, um, um, because one of the messages which tend which I think tends to get forgotten about Kerbala is it is about sort of transformation. Um, so the fact that she was brought um, to the event and that she developed into this person that could then address Yazid in his palace um, shows to me that, it, that the, um, in a very extreme way she was brought out of her um, comfort zone, if I can, if I can say that, and, and she developed into this very strong, very powerful personality in her own right, who then, on her own, own, took the religion with her. What's particularly interesting about my, uh, my own relationship with Ashura since I've converted is that, um, you know, since then, I, you know, we've had the Arab Spring, we've had the revolutions, and we've had the deadly mutation into Daesh and what they're doing in, in Iraq. And what you hear all the time from that is people saying, well, well, for example, you have these girls from Bethnal Green who have gone, you know, journey through Turkey, through to Syria, and and you and, and you hear Muslim, non-Muslims saying, "Well, you know, these are normal people from normal Muslim backgrounds. There must be something in Islam which makes them behave like this. So there must be something particularly violent, inherently violent, about the Islamic faith, which which turns people this way." Um, and that that's where I think the the Karbala message is particularly important because. Um, it shows that um, if Imam Hussein was on one side and, uh, uh, and Yazid was on another, they must have been fighting for two different things. Um, Yazid was the one who was beheading people, Yazid was the one who was oppressing pe people exactly the same way as Daesh are doing now. So you can see it, that the Imam was prepared to sacrifice himself and his own family in, in opposition to that cause, which is exactly what the sort of thing we're seeing today. So, um, from that point of view, the, the importance of the Kerbal episode is to portray, particularly to non-Muslims, that um, what um, these um, b barbarians are doing is nothing, to, is nothing to do with Islam. There is, a, there is an alternative version which the um, events of Ashur and the events of Kerbal are um, um, highlight, um, and so from that you can you build on that. On to concept, see, well, look what it did to the women. Look what it did to Zainab. Um, that there is a version of Islam which promotes the rights of women, which promotes the interests of women, which promotes the development of um, the, the community and of individuals. And it's not it's not about killing and slaying and 
um, uh, keeping people in a state of continual oppression. Doing the work I do, being a lawyer, you're expected to 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 um, be on the side of justice in in everything you do. Um, so in every letter you write, every word you utter, um, um, it, it has to be in the pursuit of truth and um, honest, in the pursuit of honesty. Um, it's um, so the so what Kerbala shows you is that um, uh, well the, the pursuit of sheep is, is something to die for. It's something you have to live. You know, every breath, uh, every breath has to be um, in, the, in the pursuit of justice and and, and the pursuit of fairness. Um, um, and of course, there's a common humanity, of course, to Kerbala as well. It's um, as Imam said said at the end, towards the end of his life, he said, "Well, if you're not, if you don't, if you don't accept what I'm saying, if you hate me, at least behave like human beings." Um, so, so there is a so there is a a basic humanity to what Imam Hussein was projecting, which um, applies to everybody, not just Muslims, um, not just believers. Um, and I think that that is the fundamentals of Kerbala, which um, we need to promote in our own lives. And it's something that struck me when I, uh, I did um, was, was in um, Kerbala during Arbaeen. Um, you have an awful lot of muakib, a lot of groups doing this and that, but they're all sort of doing the same thing. It's, it's the same sort of procession, the same matam, um, and, and there's not a great deal of diversity or, dare I say, imagination there, which is not a criticism of them necessarily, because I understand that you know this is this is such a revolutionary thing following the fall of Saddam to to have this happening again. So you can see it's in in its sort of infancy, if you like. But I was thinking when I was there, well, at some point you'd like to see some some um, some more imagination. So, for example, I was thinking when I used to have a sort of a, a sound and light show or a um, 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 street artist rec recreations of the battle in the street face painting, you know, these sorts of things that are more common to Western culture, which um, you can see as something that would, 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 be, would be a good thing to have in the commemorations um, there. Um, as far as stuff here is concerned, yes, I think there is scope for, um, for, for, for being more diversified, by people, using people's artistic skills more um, in the same way. Maybe creating a film and doing a film of, of, of aspects of the story um, would be a good idea. Um, uh, plays, that sort of thing, would be good. Um, um, uh, even an open air edge list would be good. I mean, why have it indoors? I think that, 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 that that's something I, you know is impressive. We're thinking about the Lebanese um, uh, commemorations during uh, Mashur, that, that there, there is all there is all outdoors. And to have a sort of um, a recitation outdoors instead of inside would be a very radical, but I think a very striking thing. Um, uh, um, you know, books, books, you know, books about the historical research is also an important thing. So, if, if um, from the point of view academic um, study, I think the more more should be done into the into who the personalities were, where they came from, what the reasons for the battle, what happened afterwards. Um, for example, it's often said that um, without Imam Hussein, Islam would have died. But um, uh, uh, I think more needs to be done to explain. Well, how did it sort of go from there? What was you know after after, um, uh, after the battle? You know how how did it survive? What how was the memories? Um, how was the practices re revived in the community after that? I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure I do much preparation, but once I'm in it, I, I try and participate as much as I can, even if I can't attend a, a lecture. I at least try and watch what I can online. And as I said earlier, just to re reflect on the personalities there and, and to get this sense of humility, at least through these 10 days, even if I can't get out very much or do very much, at least try and do that to, to ground myself and, and, and to reflect on you know, what the stories mean. Thank you.